Good evening, everyone. If you could please find your seat, we're going to start the program. Thank you all for coming this evening, and welcome to the fifth annual Doing Business Around Douglas. We are so glad you're here. We hope you enjoy this program and learn something that will help your business thrive. Commissioner Robinson started this event to help all business owners establish and grow relationships, learn the fundamentals of doing business, and create the atmosphere and opportunity for more diversity. To that end, and if you're interested in becoming a vendor with the county, at our registration table, we have applications. We also have um, information about our small business grants, which are part of the COVID relief efforts. Uh, and, and Tiffany may have some other stuff out there too that you might want to consider for your business. So please, if you haven't, stop by the reg registration table before you leave tonight to get that information. Okay, so before we go any further, I would like to acknowledge our elected officials here. Could our elected please stand? I know I saw, who did I see? How many do we have? Okay. In case, wait, don't sit yet, don't sit. In case you don't know, uh, this is Madam Chair, Dr. Ramona Jackson-Jones. She's the Chair of the Board of Supervisors. Wave at him, Ma uh, Madam Chair. And, and wh what did I say, supervisors? I'm sorry. Okay, and then we have um, the District 3 Commissioner and Vice Chair-Elect, Terenia Carthen, who you'll hear from a little bit later. Okay, thank you, ladies. Did I miss anybody? Y'all have to tell me, okay. So, oh, and we may have a special guest. Do we have our guest on the Zoom team in the back? If we don't, we'll come back around. Okay, she's not there. So that's okay. So now, I have a challenge for all you out there in the audience, okay? I challenge you to, before you leave tonight, to meet two new people that you didn't know and exchange information, all right? Here's the challenge. You're gonna meet two new people in this room tonight that you never knew, and you're going to exchange information. Now, in case we have any introverts in the room, I'm gonna help you get started. I'm gonna grease the wheels. So alert, this is audience participation, okay? Alert. So here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna ask you four questions, and I'm just gonna need a volunteer to answer the questions out loud, okay? Here are the questions, you ready? What is your name? Okay. What is the name of your business? Okay, okay. Hold, hold on. She's ready, okay. Why did you start your business? And does your business have a mission statement? Okay, those are pretty easy, right? Do you want me to repeat the questions? Okay, who would like to share? Okay, she's ready. Be thinking, I need at least one more participant. Okay. Virginia Murphy, um, mm, Wastewater Industrial Solutions. I'm still trying to figure that out right now. <laughs> no, I no, honestly, I actually started it not for the money, but I think that um, men are um, the reason families are supported. So I wanted to find a way to support young men to have, that didn't want to go to college but needed a trade. So my vision is to start a school. Yes, I did not come to be served, but to serve. All right, thank you. Oh, that was nice. Good job, thank you. Oh, good, one more, one more. What's your name? Antoinette Wright. My business is Affordable Family Home Care Services. I started my business because I enjoy serving others and helping others, and I do have a mission statement. 
um, just helping and serving others and helping underserved, uh, underserved populations. That's one of the purposes of this event, actually. Did you hear she said helping underserved populations? So that's really one of the founding principles uh, that Commissioner Robinson, um, why he wanted to start this event. Do we have one more? Do, do we, can we get three? Will three be the charm? Okay, this is the last, last one, best one. Hi, my name is Richard Gordon. The name of my business is RG Financial Services. I do healthcare for individual marketplace under 65 as well as over 65 and my mission statement is to help those people that don't have insurance or don't understand insurance to get a better understanding of what their options are. That was it. <laughs> okay, thank you all business owners uh, for sharing. So I just realized I didn't tell you who I was. You may want to know. My name is Wendy Caudill. I'm the District 2 Legislative Aide or Commissioner Robinson's Legislative Aide. And I support him in the district to help bring events like this to the community. So, and I will be your MC for this evening. All right. So now that we're all friends, it should be a lot easier to meet those new people and exchange information. Okay, don't forget, that's your assignment. Two new people. Okay, so let's move into meeting one of our special guests. Uh, first up, we have Commissioner Terenia Carthen, District 3 Commissioner Terenia Carthen and Vice Chair-elect. Um, District 3 Commissioner Terenia Carthen is a native of Atlanta and holds a Computer Information Systems degree and a Bachelor of Science degree as a graduate of Atlanta Christian College. As an entrepreneur and minority business owner of a health technology consulting firm, Commissioner Carthen has served in the healthcare and technology sectors for over 20 years. Her dedication to excellence in the medical and technology field may be seen in her philanthropic work that includes co-founding the Angels in Tech, Angels in Me Foundation, which was created to benefit young girls and encourage them to pursue careers in science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics, or STEAM. In recognition of her work in the field, Commissioner Carthen was recognized as an outstanding entrepreneur by Who's Who in Black Atlanta. Currently, Vice Chair-elect for the Douglas County Board of Commissioners 2023-2024, Commissioner Carthen is passionate about service to her community and providing opportunities for minority business owners to gain experience and grow their business. During her first year as a commissioner, Carthen sponsored legislation to put into place Douglas County's first MBE to ensure the county would do business with disadvantaged businesses when seeking procurement of goods and services. So far, that initiative has landed MBEs in the county to gain more than 50% of the current SPLOST spend in services. And you'll hear more about the SPLOST a little bit later. Commissioner Carthen is a proud mother of four beautiful daughters, all in STEAM, related fields of study and work. During her spare time, she serves as a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated and a member of the Lynx Incorporated, while volunteering in both her community and church to ensure others have during ensuring others have what they need during their time of need. So let's welcome Commissioner Carthen. Thank you, Wendy. Good afternoon or evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the fifth How to Do Business Around Douglas County. Um, as Wendy just mentioned, I am the District 3 Commissioner, um, and I am Vice Chair-Elect. So this man to the left of me is going to have to relinquish his title in a few, uh, but he knows it'll be in good hand, right? Yes, OK. <laughs> so um, I have the distinct honor of giving a few remarks tonight. And so if you know me, I'm very brief. I, I don't talk long, and I don't talk long on the board, so I won't, you know. I won't do that tonight, but uh, this is a very special occasion in that the man and the vision um, that the man had to put this together is really all about how he thinks, how he wants this county to grow, and that is none other than Vice Chair um, Commissioner Kelly Robinson. Um, upon meeting Commissioner Robinson, the first thing that I noticed about him is that he's a fighter. Now, if you don't know him, 
you would think he's very mild-mannered, but he will come to the mat and the bat for anybody that needs it, and especially in regards to entrepreneurship. He is a business-minded man, so much so that he has 27 years of business experience, and he's currently the CEO of Archie May, which is a housing advocacy and capital markets firm. Now, he has managed portfolios in the millions and billions of dollars, yet, his main thing is to serve, and he does that without regard to himself. You would not know it, but the man to my left is legally blind. The way he gets around, the way he does things, his acumen, the way he sees and senses things, you would never know it unless you knew him personally. He doesn't lead with that. What he leads with is his advocacy and his spirit to serve. And so what you will get tonight is an extension of him. You will get presenters tonight who will talk about how they started their businesses, how they had to fight to keep their businesses going, and how they are doing business in, around, about, and with Douglas County. So get ready. What you are about to hear will help you either start your business, expand your business, or find somebody to go into business with. You will want to leave here with the tools and the knowledge to do what? Business around Douglas. Thank you so much for joining us. Get ready, get ready. And now, I would like to introduce Vice Chair Kelly Robinson. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. This, this, I'll be very quick. And so, where, where's she go? Come back up here. No, um, I, I've got to thank um, again, Commissioner Robinson. Thank you guys all for being here. But before she leaves, um, I appreciate you. I appreciate you. No, did, did she? It was not um, hard to relinquish. You're the future. I took this serious when I cast my vote, making sure that the future is ready for this county. As I in my, my fourth and final term, I'm preparing the way. It's not only just creating the atmosphere, but it's also making sure the right people are in place. When I say she is the future, she's got it. She's the heart for the county. Yeah, I'm the fighter, I'm the warrior, but you need somebody who's gonna take it now. Peace, run it for the next 150 years. So I, I laid this down easily, right? This was intentional, right? By design, I saw this coming before y'all even got started. She was the one. So, Please don't understand, my, my stepping back is just that. I'm, I'm still the OG. I just can step back from the background and, and manage things. But at the same point, just recognize, you know, it's time for me to go back and have a new voice for the county and stuff. So I thank you so much for being here for me. It is an honor and a pleasure. Thank, thank you, you, madam. Thank you. Yes. Give her a hand clap, guys. All right. Well, well, welcome again, everybody in the audience, as well as everybody that's online. We are online, right? Yes? All right, this is a live studio audience um, as well as on uh, what we call Facebook and Zoom. So we're going to get started here because I've got some comments I'm going to say, but I just want to, before I bring up my keynotes, um, I, I think it's important. And, and Wendy sort of stole my, my thunder. I thought she was preparing to, um, uh, me to ask why I started, but she already answered it. So, uh, but I'll, I'll say it this way, um, and, and, and from, a, from a place of my heart. Um, again, I came in 08. Um, Think about where you were in 08, the Great Recession. Harrison, we just talked about this. It was a different place in America and in the county. It was totally different, right? It was a different psychology. So here I am, the youngest ever as, elect, as a commissioner ever elected. And I'm like, oh wow, it's just getting to know this atmosphere. And it was a very closed environment. It, it, it was very elitist, familial, local. Nothing got in. It was contained. And it's like, okay, so that nobody could do business with Douglas. Nobody wanted to really visit Douglas because of his reputation. It's like, hold on, hold on, hold on. It was a psychology. It's like, but what about all these other people here? What about people who are paying taxes? How do they not get advantage, take advantage of the very things that we're taxing them on? And what I noticed is like these 13 families that were pretty much had control of this county. But it's 100,000 people. It's like, okay, we got to change this. And then you had a system on the inside that was reinforcing it. I, no, we got to break that up. So I set on my mission. And the only one in 2016 when Madam Chair joined us that we can, we had the, the right combination of three, 
to begin to shift this. Right? In other words, we're talking about equality, equity. Right? In other words, I get taxes, guys, but at the same point, well, shouldn't you get to participate in it? These forever contracts, right? These forever jobs. But what about people who are here? What about day generation? We got to wait until all of them die off and then now we rush in? No, create an atmosphere where you got to compete every year. I got to compete every four years, compete. So this is about competition. This is about equality, giving you an opportunity. So I won't belabor this because I know the guest speaker is going to do this, but what's important for me five years ago, again, five years ago, this month, I started this when we took the majority to change the atmosphere. And I sat on a mission to make sure that everybody, you know, come do business with us. I have people outside of, of Douglas saying, man, we don't want to come over there. Y'all know that thing is locked down. We won't get a fair shake and stuff. The, the bids to do, I was like, hold on, hold on. And I'm looking inside and I'm looking around, oh, they right. And I, I, I couldn't accept that. It was unacceptable. And so we created an atmosphere that we thought was proper through Madam McCarthy getting there. She got in and got that, that procurement going. We began to change the rules. We made sure people could fairly bid. We have formal committees, thank you, Madam Chair, that we could actually look at things. We had open, we were transparent. And so we're saying, Douglas County, we're ready for you to do business with us, around us, within us, and for us. So what, that's what this is really about. What I've done with this particular event is to talk about, it's all about education. It, it's not just to inspire. Yes, the speakers I got, oh, they're gonna bring it. But it, not only just to inspire, but it's also to impart at some point, we'll get into implementation and ultimately we get into institutionalizing that in your own lives, right? So in other words, guys, don't just sit back and watch everybody else. It's like, come on, everybody get a plate. Everybody can participate in the process and stuff. So I, I, I'm, it was just about creating an atmosphere and that's all my job is. I'm, I'm not a thermometer, I'm a thermostat. Let's change this, but we all are part of this. And so with that being said, because I got some more comments, but we're gonna go ahead and get started. So Wendy, we're gonna go ahead and bring up our first keynote speaker, let's just get into this and I'll, I'll come back throughout this and I'll drive home further why this is very important. But I need you to pay attention because this is important to me. While I can't see you guys, I can't see you, but it's all about listening. You know, sometimes I get challenged about do I listen? That's all I can do. But you have to listen. Listen to the salient words that these two keynote speakers are gonna bring here. Listen to their heart. Look about, look, listen to the story they're trying to get you. It's all about information, right? Sometimes it's that guys just just here, it may just be that one word that drops in your spirit and now allows you to go to a brand new whole level, right? Because right now with this pandemic, guys, okay, think about it now, we're almost through this thing. Madam Chair, we're always talking about life, yes, okay, but now we're about to talk about quality of life. Congress made it rain, right? The difference in Paris between the Great Recession and now is that because Congress bailed everybody out, right? Everybody floated, the whole system, yeah, it's inflating, yeah, I get inflation, but guys, have they not done that? Y'all know y'all, PPP, whatever, y'all all benefit, the whole system it made us whole. Now, I hope y'all did right by that money now. They gonna come get you, but I'm just, I had to say that for the feds, like, all right now. But, but you guys get my point. It was like, okay, Congress did their part. They gave, like, okay, they gave you a little something. All right, now take advantage of this now. Back up, yes, I'm sure, wash up, but let's raise up and move forward. So with that being said, let's go ahead and bring our first guest speaker, Wendy. Yes, sir. Our first guest speaker, we're, we really have some excellent um, keynotes this year. I think you all are going to be very pleased and interested to hear what they say. Our first keynote speaker is Michael Russell. Michael Russell has served as Chief Executive Officer of H.J. Russell and Company in Atlanta, Georgia since 2003. H.J. Russell & Company, founded over 60 years ago, is a vertically integrated service provider specializing in real estate development, construction, program management, and property management. The construction division has extensive experience in building and renovating projects in diverse market segments, including high-profile office, parking decks, public assembly, retail, multifamily residential, student housing, institutional, educational, and sports facilities. Prior to becoming Chief Executive Officer, Mr. Russell served in various executive roles since joining the company in 1990, most recently as Executive Vice President, where he was responsible for the management and strategic direction of the construction and program management divisions. Mr. Russell is a member of the Board of Directors of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, he is also Vice Chairman of Concessions International, an innovator in the airport food and beverage concessions industry. 
Mr. Russell is actively involved in the strategic direction and growth initiatives of concessions. The Russell Companies, which consists of H.J. Russell and Company and Concessions International, employs more than 2,000 individuals with operations in 10 major cities, including its Atlanta headquarters, Dallas, Washington, D.C., Miami, Raleigh, Seattle, Denver, and the Virgin Islands. Mr. Russell serves on the Executive Committee of the Metro Atlanta Chamber and the Boards of Directors of the Atlanta Committee for Progress and Georgia Research Alliance. He is also a member of the Atlanta Rotary Club and 100 Black Men. Mr. Russell received his BS degree in civil engineering from the University of Virginia and received his MBA from Georgia State University. And through the power of technology, Mr. Russell will be uh, joining us through Zoom. So if you watch your screen, he should pop up magically and let's welcome him. Well, thank you. Well, thank you, Sierra. I, I, I appreciate that introduction. And to my leader, uh, Commissioner uh, Robinson, and to others there um, from the Douglas County Commission, I'm, I'm honored to be, to be on Zoom with you. I'm sorry I'm not with you in person. I had a business trip out of town, and I could not be there in person, but I'm certainly supportive of what the county's doing, um, this initiative of the commissioner to really, you know, to, to expand the opportunity for business in Douglas County. So um, I'm very thankful for, for that opportunity. And I, I think what I'm going to do um, um, this evening is give you just a brief introduction of myself and our organizations that, you know, are within the Russell uh, enterprise. And then I'm, I'm really gonna have the commissioner kind of have a Q and A with me and I guess Harrison, I don't know at the same time commissioner or independently, but just to talk about more general things. We're going so to, what I, I Michael. Um, yes, sir. Yeah, I'm going to let you do your intro and you hit on head, um, you know, do your, your key things, open us up. I will bring Harrison, let him also get a big intro and stuff. Okay. And then we'll right. Q&A all three of us together. You got it. Beautiful, beautiful. And um, hello to Harrison also. Um, so, so what I'll do guys is give a very brief overview. I'm Michael Russell, as you heard. I've been CEO for H.J. Russell for now 16 years. Um, I am, I'm, I'm the son of Herman Russell who founded our company um, now almost 70 years ago. Uh, my father passed in 2014 and I'm very so thankful for him for his vision and direction and not only um, my role in the business, but also have a brother and a sister who are part of our business enterprises. And very briefly, I'll, I'll tell you, H.J. Russell and Company is the company that I'm CEO of. My brother, uh, Jerome Russell, is a part of that company. He works really focused on our real estate side of our business. And my sister, uh, Donata Russell Ross, is the CEO of another sister company, if you will, um, which is Concessions International. As, as Sierra mentioned, we are in the food and beverage concessions business in airports. So we're in nine airports around the nation um, and operate food and beverage um, outlets throughout, throughout the uh, country um, in those nine airports. So it, this is a business we've been in for 40 years. So we've been in our core businesses for quite a while and we're thankful that, you know, we're continuing to move forward as, um, you know, we're continuing to have success and move forward in these businesses. Um, to focus back on H.J. Russell and Company, uh, we, our three, our three core businesses are construction, um, um, commercial building, and that's in the multi, that's in a, in a variety, I'm not gonna compete, I'm not going to repeat what Sierra said, but in a variety of markets, we're also in the program management space where we help clients um, around their major capital programs. In fact, in Douglas County, we're part of the SPLOS, managing the SPLOS, not building, but we're part of managing the SPLOS um, on behalf of the county um, right now. And we're also in the real estate development business, which is, uh, that business is primarily focused in the Metro Atlanta area. Uh, we have offices in Atlanta, we have offices in Savannah, and in Dallas, Texas. So those are the three places we have offices. We kind of work all, you know, throughout the Southeast um, in various markets. Um, you know, I think what I'll do is just leave it there. If you have any questions, we'll address those later. But um, again, I'm thankful to be here. I'm sorry I couldn't see you guys in person, but I look forward to the Q&A with uh, Harrison and, and Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Robinson. So thank you.
Thank, thank you, Michael. Thank you very much. Guys, let's give him a hand clap real quick. So, so Wendy will bring up Harrison. He'll join me on the stage, and um, he'll do his introduction, then we'll have a dialogue. All right. After practicing law for three years, Mr. Merrill founded Vanguard Properties Incorporated and began a 35-year real estate development career through Vanguard Properties and later the Merrill Trust Group of Companies. Mr. Merrill's vast experience in real estate development includes the development of large mixed-use developments, master plan communities, large and small resorts, single-family housing, historic urban rehabilitation, land investment, syndication, management, brokerage, and other real estate ventures. I need a drink of water after listing all of those. Under Mr. Merrill's leadership as president and founder of the Merrill Trust Group, the Merrill Trust acquired, acquired, zoned, and wholly owned a significant amount of property in metropolitan Phoenix, Arizona, consisting of over 26,000 acres, which were zoned in multiple large master plan communities for over 123,000 lots and 3,000 acres of commercial property. These large master plan communities have a fully developed value of over 50 billion, with a B. Mr. Merrill also negotiated a tax-exempt bond authorization of over $4 billion of community facilities district bonds for the four master plan communities. The 123,000 lots made the Merrill Trust Group the largest private owner of entitled lots in the United States. Merrill Trust also acquired over 5,500 acres in metropolitan Atlanta, Georgia, which are primarily located in the Chattahoochee Hill Country area, just west of Atlanta's Hartsfield Jackson International Airport, the busiest airport in the world. Mr. Merrill was the founder of the 1,100-acre Fox Hall Resort and purchased and redeveloped the Sky Valley Resort, Catatauga Resort, and the 400-room Daytona Beach Resort and Conference Center. Earlier in his career, Mr. Merrill focused on historic rehabilitation and downtown re redevelopment with over $100 million of historic rehabilitation in downtown Atlanta, Marietta, and East Point. Mr. Merrill received a Bachelor of Arts in History from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where he was an All-American swimmer each year, NCAA record holder, captain of the swimming team, president of his class, and permanent class president and recipient of the Patterson Award for the Outstanding Senior in Scholarship, Athletics, and Leadership. Mr. Merrill was recently honored as one of the top 50 Atlantic Coast Conference swimmers in the last 50 years. Mr. Merrill received his LLB and JD with honors from the Emory University School of Law, where he was executive editor of the Law Review and the Phi Delta Phi Outstanding Freshman and Outstanding Graduate. Mr. Merrill's civic and professional activities and awards include past president of the Ugandan American Partnership Organization, now ACOLA, I hope I pronounced that right, maybe it's ACOLA, trustee of the William Harrison Merrill Fam Family Foundation, Harrison Merrill Day in Marietta and Harrison Merrill Day in the East Point area for his downtown historic redevelopment activities, the Westminster Alumni Award, ODK at Emory Law School, Bryan Society at Emory Law School, Who's Who in American Colleges and Universities at UNC, Order of the Grail at UNC, Order of the Golden Fleece at UNC, past director of the following, Century Savings and Trust Association, South Trust Bank of Georgia, the Shank School, Emory University School of Law, Atlanta Alumni Association, Westminster Alumni Association, Atlanta Easter Seal Society, and the Georgia Easter Seal Society. Please help me welcome Mr. Harrison Merrill. Wendy, thank you very much. I actually sent a paragraph Sorry about that, folks. Michael, first of all, if you can still hear me, it is a real pleasure to be a keynote speaker with you. Uh, I have watched your company uh, under your dad and under you uh, make a difference in Atlanta, the growth of Atlanta, the past of Atlanta, and the future of Atlanta. So it's a real pleasure. I also want to thank Commissioner Robinson, uh, Commissioner Jones, Commissioner Carthen, 
uh, for everything you're doing for the county and particularly what you have done for us in the last uh, couple of months. Thank you. I've been in real estate since I quit practicing law uh, almost 50 years. Uh, I've rarely had a day that I didn't wake up and have fun. I love what I do. I have a passion for what I do. Uh, I try to do things. The bigger, the better, the more fun, the more risky. And fortunately, I'm now anchored by my son who took over as the CEO 10 years ago and is now my boss and has been my boss and actually has started Fox Hall and made Fox Hall what it is. And I'm proud to say with five children that my son, since he's taken over, he's better than his dad who has 40 years more of experience. Uh, he's more cautious than his dad. I don't think I understood risk properly, probably still don't, but I sure have had a lot of fun. So let me tell you about Fox Hall. Fox Hall is 1,100 acres on the Chattahoochee River with 16 lakes. It was among, when I saw it, the most beautiful properties I've ever seen anywhere uh, in the country, for that fact, in the world that I've seen. Uh, when we bought it, I bought it originally as a farm for my five kids. We're all city slickers. And I wanted them to learn about the outside. <clears throat> my son understood it, loved the outside. But as I kept passing the airport, literally 22 minutes from the 1,100 acres in Foxhall, where you feel like you're genuinely 500 miles from civilization, the developer got in me. And I said, this needs to be a resort, and not only a resort, a resort of resorts. It's within 30 minutes of downtown Atlanta, one of the best metropolitan areas in America. It's 22 minutes from the busiest airport in the world. And yet, as you come down the South Fulton Parkway, it feels a world away. And we started, we started with the county, Commissioner Robinson, as you'll recall, in 2008, we spent two years meeting with the county every single week until the zoning for Fox Hall became our collaborative zoning. Ours is the Merrill family and Douglas County. Our vision was as one. And then we were kind of in the midst of the Great Recession. It was no longer when you could simply draw a picture and people would come and they would buy, you had to prove it. So the growth of Foxhall had to be done largely internally. Uh, we have 76 uh, rooms, we have two lodges, we have a couple of hundred thousand square feet of meeting space, including our outdoor space and our luxury event venues. We've had over 800 weddings. We started in reverse. Normally you get a hotel and then you get events. In our case, we didn't have a hotel, so we created events. And we have about 400 events, 450 events before the pandemic. That went down to a grand total of zero and now we're building back and we probably have 300 to 350 events uh, this year. But when you think of Fox Hall, I want you to think about fun. I want you to think about legacy. This is a legacy project for Douglas County. It's a legacy project for the city of Atlanta. It's a legacy project for the Southeast. This is where people come and they create memories with their families or with their groups or for their weddings that lasts a, life, a lifetime. We have about 40 different activities. Uh, the county was kind enough to zone us for the largest resort zoning in the history of Atlanta. We can build from 2,500 to 3,000 units. So the Weston, which is 254 units, we hope to break ground the end of the second quarter, the beginning of the third quarter this year. It's a $175 million project that together with everything else going on Fox Hall, that'll bring a couple of hundred thousand people to Douglas County each year. So what I'd like to do is first thank the county, thank the commissioners, 
for helping us to be in a position with this very unusual financial market uh, to have the bonds to be able to finance Foxhall without any risk at all on the county. Secondly, I want to thank the county. I've lived here now personally. I moved from Buckhead, and I don't think you can say more than this. I moved from Buckhead, and I love Buckhead. I was born in Buckhead, went to school in Buckhead, to high school, thought I'd die in Buckhead. So finally, when I kept leaving Foxhall to go back to Buckhead, I said, you know what? This is so beautiful, I can't believe I'm leaving this every day. I'm going to move down here. So I moved down, and I thought, I can go back to Buckhead five or six times a week. It's only 40 minutes, no problem. I'll now tell you, having lived here 10 years, 11 years, that I resent going back to Buckhead once a month. <laughs> I've got everything I need right here in Foxhall, right here in Douglas County. I've got friends, I've got places to shop, I've got quality of life, I've got open space, I've got parks, I've got everything except traffic. And I don't miss that at all. So, uh, Commissioner Robinson, uh, when you're ready, we'll join you for a question and answer. Again, it's a pleasure to be here. I saw Sarah Ray, is she still here? Uh, head of the chamber? No, she's, she left. Okay, she had to leave. Mm -hmm. She and Chris Pumphrey have done a wonderful job, I can tell you, for the county as the Chamber of Commerce and the Development Authority. They have been incredibly supportive of us, and I'm sure if you work here, supportive of you also, and I thank them too. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Merrill. <laughs> Commissioner. Commissioner and Mr. Merrill, if you'll just have a seat. One of our very special Zoom guests is here and he's going to need to leave so we want to pop him on. Can, uh, can our technical support get Representative Williams up? It is just a tremendous honor uh, to be able to be here with you all virtually uh, for my dear friend, uh, my capital fraternity brother, uh, vice chairman of the Douglas County uh, Board of Commissioners, Commissioner Kelly Robson. Thank you uh, for just allowing us to be a part of this amazing event for five years, uh, the fifth annual doing business in Douglas County. And I'm very, I'm very happy and proud to say that I've been doing business in Douglas County now since 2011. And uh, my law office is located on Chapel Hill Road. That's my day job. I'm a lawyer, a law office of Bodie and Associates. But also, I'm a state legislator. And I see my Madam Chair on the call, uh, Representative Kimberly Alexander. Uh, we are currently in legislative session right now. I'm not going to steal her thunder. We passed two measures yesterday for Douglas County that I'm very proud of. And so we're doing the work right now at the Gold Dome. Uh, this is going to be my last legislative session. Uh, I represent House District 62, portions of South Fulton and Douglas County, and I have been over to Fox Hall, and it is beautiful. Uh, but this is going to be my last session. Uh, it's been a, an amazing experience uh, serving in the General Assembly. Uh, I'm now running for Georgia Labor Commissioner, which is a statewide position on the ballot in May, on May the 24th for the Democratic primary. So I just want to thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, soaking up this is amazing knowledge from this amazing panel. Uh, so thank you all for having me this evening. Commissioner Keller Robinson, Mr. Vice Chairman, thank you for all that you do for Douglas County. Anytime and every time I've called on you, you have always been there for my small business summits and any and everything else that I've also asked of you. So thank you, Sierra. Thank you, Wendy. And also thank you to my dear friend, Tiffany Stanley. So thank you all for having me tonight and have a good evening. Thank you so much, Representative. Um, Thank you. We have one more uh, special guest that would like to send some greetings and uh, well wishes to us. We have Madam Rep, uh, Representative Kimberly Alexander. There she is. Madam Rep, how are you? Thank you for being here this evening. I am good. Thank you so much. Um, congratulations to Commissioner Kelly Robinson on his fifth 
and you're doing business around Douglas County. Uh, five years, that is phenomenal. So thank you for everything that you continue to do in, in Douglas County and in the community. And welcome to all the participants. I hate that I can't be there. As uh, Representative Bodie said, our next um, commission, Department of Labor. <laughs> um, we are busy, busy, busy at the Capitol, and it's been a long day today. Uh, and then I got to get back on a Zoom meeting immediately following uh, this meeting. So I just wanted to jump on, say hello, um, just, just give greetings and welcome you all. And if there's anything that I can ever do, please, please, please do not hesitate to reach out to me. My door is always open and I'm a phone call away. So thank you guys, I appreciate you. Thank you, Madam Rep. Thank you everyone for indulging this, this little um, diversion. Uh, we wanted to make sure that our reps got a chance to speak to you um, and they have somewhere else to be. So we just, we got, we grabbed them when we could, okay? So now we're back. We're gonna go back and and to have a discussion with our keynote speakers, Mr. Harrison Merrill and Mr. Mike Russell. Can we get Mr. Russell back on the, on the screen? Yeah, we'll be quick. Uh, again, this is the first part of our, of our panel. Uh, we've got a second panel that's be coming in the second hour here. So we're just going to jump right into this. So uh, we're, we're going to have a conversation between the three, uh, three of us. And so we're going to go quick and speed. So I'm going to put some words out there. I want you to tell me what they mean for you. Think about the audience that's here, those who are um, obviously online or are present here, and try to drop some wisdom into them. I mean, this is about impartation, right? We do this because as a leader, it's not about us, it's about others, right? We create this platform to ensure that, look, they're trying to be like you guys. Right? So there's something you can share with them. You know, I'm always about inclusion, transparency, empowerment, and so we're gonna to try to do that here. So first things up, you guys, we get their background and stuff, so both of you, and Michael, we'll start with you since you were, obviously, uh, Harrison just spoke. Now, what does the word teaming mean to you? What does teaming mean to you? And I'm gonna ask you, Harrison, as well. What does that mean for your, for your organization? Was it important, is it important? Teaming, talk to me. Um, it means strategic growth. It means one plus one should equal three, if you're doing it right. Um, it means being able to learn and grow in, in markets, um, both partners. It means uh, building capacity. Um, so, you know, I'll stop there. I mean, you could go on forever, but those are some of the key things I think about when you mention teaming. Absolutely. So Harrison, teaming, that concept of teaming. It's very difficult to grow and grow well, if not impossible, without teaming with other people hopefully who are smarter than you are in each of the areas of expertise. I can tell you on the Western, we pulled together Cooper Carey as the architect. They're one of the uh, largest architectural firms in the world for hospitality. We bought in the largest architectural company in the world, Gensler, to do our interiors. We bought in Choate for construction. Uh, it's the kind of thing we, we brought in uh, the largest bond underwriter for hotels uh, in the world, Piper Sandler. These are the type of people that you need to team with in order to grow, in order to be successful, and in order to produce the best possible product. Teaming means a lot. And I appreciate that. So, so Michael, again, and to Harrison, think about teaming for the people in the audience. You either have um, emerging enterprises or those who are already existing. So here I am trying to bid on a million dollar firehouse in Douglas County. I may have put down brick, but, but how do I, I can't quite bond for that. And one of the concepts of teaming that we try to promote here is like, guys, okay, you're not quite qualified yet. It's not that the system is against you, but you don't have the credentials yet. You ain't got the experience. I appreciate that you, know, you, you think you do, but you need to go partner with somebody who's already done that. So to the point of teaming, and Michael, you know this, how H.J. Uh, Russell, according to you guys, his documentary, your dad, you know, sheetrock, partnered with the holders, got, got three years on his belt, did not, he could bid on his own. So part of, the, part, part of this is, 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 is working with others. But guys, give me some, some of the drawbacks of teaming. Like, I mean, we're talking about partners. You got to share the margins. 
right? You got to share. One of the challenges I see sometimes with young entrepreneurs is that, you know, you finally got a chance to get something, but you want to eat everything. And it's, so, guys, give us some wisdom, give them some wisdom about the discipline that's necessary to, to sort of share and deal with the margins. Harrison, we go for Harrison first, and then we go back to Michael. Harrison? Well, let, let me just say again, Michael, what a pleasure it is to uh, be a keynote speaker with you and your, your business. You have done a fantastic job. Uh, I think they are the quintessential example of teaming that I know of in Atlanta's history uh, with you and your dad and, and the various folks that you've teamed with over the years and done a fantastic job. So my honor. Uh, we, we mentor, we don't team a lot. Uh, I did uh, some, uh, and when I say team a lot, I'm talking about joint ventures. Uh, I used to, when I was a young lawyer and uh, stopped practicing law and got into real estate, I didn't know what I was doing. At that time, you could really close your eyes, throw a dart at a map, and wherever that dart landed, you could buy land and you could do very, very well. The problem when you're young is you think it's you when really it's the dart. It's the dart. You, 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 it's just real estate is a magnificent business. I used to do a lot of syndication. And what I found out is that uh, about 5% of the investors are never happy. 95% who are happy are very quiet. And over the years, Except for our projects, uh, we've kind of gone it alone in terms of, uh, uh, of the projects themselves, and we bring in teams to help us, teams of planners, uh, construction teams, um, uh, engineers, and folks like that without whom we could not have been successful. Thank you for that. So, Michael, I'm going to swing back over to you, and I'm going to extend that from teaming as well as to diversity. Right? In other words, yeah. talk about teaming from your perspective and while diversity, and as you know, those are two of the same formula. Talk to us, please. Well, well, thinking about your audience, and I'm just going to say generally smaller businesses, I think it's a couple of things. One is um, teaming is essential. I mean, Harrison said it. I mean, it takes a team to get almost anything done. But I think a couple of things. One is be clear on expectations. I mean, what is it that you bring to the table? You know, as my dad said, you know, you got to come to the table with more than an appetite. You know, you got to bring some value. So, you know, as as a business, what is it that you bring that you can enhance the team with? Two, I think you have to work with um, with 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 people who you have some some moral character. Now, that's tricky. I mean, obviously, we all, you know, we have to learn, but try to work with people who you can who who you think are are honestly are are going to treat you fair. That's all you can ask for. Somebody treats you fair. Um, third, I think, is really get to know as you look at teaming, understand who still, who are you working for? Get to know your client. Um, I think it's always important that, you know, as you partner up and I'm, and I'm thinking about ourselves as we partner over the years with for, you know, various projects on the construction side as a prime contractor. I like to know my client. Don't don't um, don't don't discount that. Um, another key thing is. Make sure you're building capacity. I mean, you're not teaming. If you're teaming just to make a dollar, um, that's not sustainable and that's not going to keep your business sustainable. So you have to really figure out what am I doing with this team in agreement that's going to allow me to grow my business in a sustainable way? You know, how are you having people on the job? How are you growing people? How are you gaining knowledge from it that you can legitimately take to another opportunity that you can, that you can benefit from. So um, Commissioner Robinson, I'll stop there. But so those are some of the key things that come to my mind when you no, mentioned teaming. I appreciate that. So we're going to keep going. We've got a couple more questions. We're going to keep firing this. So then to extend that, what you talked about growing. So let's talk about expansion. So we've gone from teaming. We've got to partner with somebody. You sort of talked about your eyes didn't really hit the need for doing diversity, but tie that into expansion. In other words, this is a formula that's created. No. All right, so well, I mean, I will, I'll start off by, I mean, expansion is, and, and I will, I'll say expansion and diversification. Let me put both of those kind of together. To me, as I look at our history as an organization, it's been essential to, again, our sustainability. You know, I, I know it doesn't happen overnight because we're, we, we're large enough now that we have different business units and different markets, but 
as uh, but we've seen over the years that as one market might be down, take what we're going through now. The retail, um, you know, even though uh, uh, Merrill mentioned the Western, I mean, hospitality is coming back, but hospitality has had it very difficult the last couple of years. But you know, the fact if you're in different markets, you can help you can help to buffer yourself against um, you know downturns in any a market or business unit. So diversification is important. And I, I just think expansion is essential for growth and sustainability. And I always like to say, particularly as you start to build people, quality people want to grow. And you can't expect to stay in one place and be able to keep quality people. You have to always have a plan for growing your business and making it and allowing people to grow and personally and professionally for you to be able to retain um, those the the type of people you need in a business. So I think expansion is just ex, um, essential to business sustainability. Harrison, diversification, maybe products and services that you offer as well as expansion. I agree. I agree with Michael. I think you've got to have opportunities for your good employees, your good associates, the people you work with, uh, the teams that you work with in order for them to be able to grow and expand with you. Expansion also is just fun. It's fun to have expansion. It's fun to have diversification. Uh, Fox Hall, by design, has multiple pieces to it. It has a resort piece. It has activities piece. We have 40 different activities at Fox Hall. Uh, all of them are fun. All of them appeal to different people. Some of them appeal to everybody. Uh, and so, uh, some people love all of the activities, but usually they're focused on some of those activities. Events, events for corporate uh, clients, for weddings with our 800 weddings that we've had, uh, but particularly for families, but for all of them to make memories. That's part of diversification, that's part of expansion, that's part of a mission statement, and expansion, growth, and diversification are fun. Uh, it, it could get very dull, and, and, and again, uh, Michael's company is a great example. I've never seen them get dull of diversification, and we do a certain amount of diversification ourselves, but we always focus on real estate. Thank you for that. And so we're going to bring it to the final question. This is legacy, and both of you guys represent um, two, two generations. And so as you, 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 you frame your, your response to legacy in light of, you know, in the past 10 years, a recession and obviously now in the pandemic, talk to us about lessons that you learned uh, when you really talk about when things go wrong. And um, what would you say to them, again, regarding legacy? In other words, what would you share with them, but also what would you share internally within your families? Michael, you go, and Harrison will let you close okay. out. Okay. Yeah, well, legacy, obviously. Obviously, I represent a, a, a company, and um, as Harrison said, thank you for, for what he said about our company. But we've been around a while, and we've had some good success, and we frankly represent um, a successful black business that has been around and has not only grown, but we've grown people. I'm, I'm much, you know, one of the legacies that, sh that I'm so proud of as I look at our history is how, how we've grown other entrepreneurs out of H.J. Russell that have gone on to start their own businesses and, and, and be successful, which to me is, is the epitome of being a, a great incubator, you know. And um, as, as Harrison knows, Egbert Perry or, or Noel Khalil in the housing market, and, and, and others who, who played a critical role at Russell and spent their, a lot of their formative years at H.J. Russell, but had the entrepreneurial willpower and, the, and, 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 and as Harrison knows, had the guts and the, and, and the savvy to, to go out and build their own businesses. And, but they came, a lot of their formative years were with H.J. Russell, and these are black entrepreneurs. So to me, that's a huge legacy. And as I look at my own legacy, um, as I'm, I'm 57 almost now, I look and say, how can I make sure that I'm growing people, I'm growing businesses? Obviously, H.J. Russell has to be successful, but at the same time, this is a bigger, bigger picture. As we all, as we, as we, as we, as we look at our own in, impact, I want people to say, well, hey, Michael Russell had a positive impact 
on this community, you know, both from growing people, growing businesses, and just and just trying to make Atlanta and Metro Atlanta a better place. So um, legacy is very important to me and it helps motivate me uh, every day. Thank you for that. And Harrison, you get the last one. Might add that Trammell Crow, most of you may not have heard of Trammell, but he's kind of the father of real estate uh, across the country. Phenomenal guy. The spinoffs have been nothing short of phenomenal. The H.J. Russell Company, Michael, has been the Trammell Crow for black businesses in real estate. They have probably grown more uh, black entrepreneurs and also minority entrepreneurs than any other company that I know of in the country. Uh, legacy to me start. I have five children. Uh, legacy starts with the children. I remember my mother saying, and I never understood until I had my own, she said, you know, you three boys are our legacy, and your children are your legacy. And then you spin off of that, and the projects become your legacy. We all want to do legacy projects that make a difference. One of the things I love about Fox Hall, one of the things I love about another couple of thousand acre project, a little bit close to the airport, we'll be announcing in probably six to eight months, is they're transformational in their nature. They are legacy projects. They're projects that will make a difference. Uh, Michael's company has been involved in that for, for how many years, Michael? 60? Well, almost 70 years now. 70, 70 years. I've been privileged to be involved in that in some cases for 45 to 50 years. I had forgotten when I moved to Douglas County that, uh, that one of the first master plan communities in the, in the state we did in the early 70s uh, in Douglas County. So those are the kind of legacy projects that, uh, uh, Arbor Station, by the way, uh, we started that in 1972 as a joint venture with, uh, uh, with a service company for an SNL. But legacy projects are something where you leave something behind and you leave people who are better off because you were there and you did what you did. They're iconic and they're fun. And we hope that Fox Hall will be one of those and we hope it'll be a legacy project for Douglas County as well as a wider area. Thank you for that. And, and Michael, thank you for that. And again, we're gonna close this out. Guys, give them a hand clap for their participation in the closing. You know, for, for me, to both of you, it was just such an honor that you, you took my phone call and, and that you responded um, to, it wasn't about me. It's something that I knew that you guys had, something that the citizens needed to hear and see. You've allowed me to come into your lives to see certain things. So it was such an honor that you guys accepted this. Um, this is the beginning of sort of I'm doing a master class series and you guys are the beginning of it. So thank you for your leadership and what you stand for by way of families and what the American Dream is about. You guys are that and we are that. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you all again. Give me a hand clap, please. Michael, thank you, sir. We're gonna go on now to our next session. Wendy, back to you. Okay. We are up for our diversity and capitalism panel. So, before we introduce our next guests, I just want to kind of get you all in the frame, frame what this panel is about for you. So we all know the past few years have been trying, right? And uh, there has been a lot of tensions. There has been a lot of calls for justice. Uh, there's, been a lot, uh, there's been a lot happening. Right, and a, there's been a huge spotlight on justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion in all disciplines, right? In, in every discipline, in our social systems, in our educational systems, um, people are, are calling for accountability. So, um, as we mentioned before, one of Commissioner Robinson's um, reasons for starting this event was to do just that give a spotlight to justice, equity, diversity, and, and inclusion. And that's what our panel discussion is going to be um, focused around. We're gonna be talking to minority business owners. So our first business owner, where did he go? There he is. You can go get your thing now. 
So our first business owner is Michael Smith. He is a veteran, and I'm going to tell you, I'm introducing him first because I have a very special place in my heart for our armed services. I'm the wife of a veteran. I'm the daughter-in-law of a veteran. I'm the niece of a veteran. I'm the sister-in-law of a veteran. And what I'm most proud of is I'm the granddaughter of a World War II veteran who went to Normandy and came back. So uh, today we're not doing ladies first, we're doing veterans first. <laughs> so Michael Smith is the founder and CEO of A Veteran and a Truck, LLC, of Douglasville, Georgia. A Veteran and a Truck is a dumpster company specializing in debris and waste management. Michael is a native of, native of Macon, Georgia, where he spent his childhood graduating from Westside High School with no, insight, with no insight of where his career endeavors would lead. Michael decided to join the United States Army to serve as an information technology specialist. With destinations as far as Iraq, Sergeant Michael Smith retired medically with a few lifelong conditions. Michael has an extensive background in business, network options, commercial truck driving, and emergency disaster management. Michael achieved success on a long distance platform with his dumpster business in disaster areas such as New Orleans with FEMA. He decided to take his business to a local level. Customers truly only need a great soldier in a company of transportation. A veteran and a truck was perfect for the name of such a company. Michael enjoys helping customers with their dumpster needs, and in addition, the company helps other entre entrepreneurs such as roofers, carpenters, realtors, arborists, prop and property managers. These entrepreneurs all require a great dumpster company to assist with their goals. Michael currently resides in Douglasville, Georgia, where he plans to retire permanently. He enjoys the summer, learning new skills, watching sports, and taking vacations with his family. He values networking, family, and being an advocate of financial literacy for children. So let's give uh, Mr. Michael Smith, Smith a welcome. Next, we have Ms. Uh, April Tesmer. April, would you come on up? April Tesmer is a co-owner of a Sears Cigar on Thornton Road. When she is not busy assisting in running the business, she is a senior financial consultant for Chick-fil-A Corporate. Prior to these two commitments, April spent 20 years with Cousins Properties Incorporated in Nonami LLC as a corporate accountant, responsible for managing a multi-million dollar annual budget. April currently serves on the board of directors for Agape, the advisory board for SELC Women Incorporated, and is also on the board of directors for the Kimberly D. Burton Foundation. An avid community service volunteer, she is a loyal supporter and fundraiser for the ALS Association Georgia chapter. April holds a BA in communications from Oglethorpe University and a master's in finance from Clark Atlanta University. She enjoys spending time with family and friends, traveling and reading. April resides in Atlanta with her husband, Brian, who is also an owner at the Asire Cigar. Let's welcome Ms. A April Tesmer. <laughs> and last but not least, Ms. Sarah President. Ms. President, you can come on up, Ms. President, yeah. Ms. President is a board-certified family nurse practitioner and the CEO founder of Medicus Medical Clinic, a primary care practice that serves families in the Douglasville and Metro Atlanta area since August of 2018. She is honored to be the proud recipient of the Douglas County 2020 Business of Excellence Award. She is also the founder of Grace Oasis Personal Care Home, which is contracted with the state of Georgia to manage the care of their medically fragile population. She has been a healthcare provider for almost 30 years, serving at different capacities within the healthcare profession. She holds a bachelor's of nursing from the State University of New York and a master's in nursing from South University, Savannah campus. She is the recipient of their 2019 Alumni of the Year Award. She also has a master's degree in business with a concentration in healthcare management from Phoenix University. She has applied to the doctoral program at Grand Canyon University with an expectant start date in the fall of 2022. Ms. President is committed and dedicated to the healthcare profession. Her greatest passion is to educate people to become their self-care agents and to support all people on their journey to wellness. Let's give Ms. President a welcome. 
So uh, thank you panel for being here. I'd just like to ask you all to introduce yourselves briefly and tell us a little bit about your business. We're going to go in reverse order. Ms. President, would you, would you mind? Oh, and if you would use the microphones at your, on the table, please, so we can all hear you. Good evening, everyone. Evening. Commissioner Kelly, I would like to really thank you and your team for um, having me here today. When I'm called to serve, I say I. <laughs> um, I'd like to um, really be grateful for being here and um, for um, having the opportunity to speak with women who, and men, I guess everyone here in Douglasville who are entrepreneurs. Um, I'm a mother of two, I'm married, and um, I live here in Douglas County. Um, it has been one of the most rewarding experience for me, especially working with the Chamber of Commerce. Everyone there has been so supportive. Um, when I moved here about 16 years ago, um, I didn't know where to start, and I went into the Chamber, and, and the reception that I received was one that was warm, and um, I've enjoyed living here. It's a, an area that I really would like to continue to live in and to be able to serve the community and the people that lives in it. Good evening, everyone. Commissioner Kelly, I'd also like to thank you for the honor um, to serve on this panel. Um, I really appreciate the exposure. Um, so as we, Wendy mentioned earlier, uh, we own a Sears Cigar on Thornton Road. We are a full service restaurant, bar, and cigar lounge. We have an upscale, uh, modern American menu with luxury liquor brands and over 300 premium cigar types to choose from. So my husband and I started smoking cigars together as a hobby a few years ago, and we were previously in the hospitality business as well, and decided to marry our passions um, together and open a business here in um, Douglas County. And we have been truly blessed and grateful for um, that opportunity. And good evening. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty honored to be here. These guys have been in business longer than I've been alive. <laughs> I hear them talking about 40, 70 years, so on and so forth. I'm 34, I'm a young entrepreneur. But anyway, uh, my name is Michael Smith. I'm the owner of a veteran in the truck. Uh, I run a dumpster, a local dumpster, junk removal, and bobcat service around Douglasville and surrounding areas. I started my debris work actually chasing storms, actually, uh, when there are storms in New Orleans, the panhandle of Florida, so on and so forth. I was the guy that comes you know, right behind the storm and make sure uh, people's homes get back to restored, get the trees off cars, so on and so forth. My wife got tired of me you know, leaving. I have dinner at 8 o'clock, and the next thing you know, I'm gone for three months. So she hated that, so I started a local side. And so with the local side, I. I rent the dumpsters to people that need uh, junk removals, uh, if you're doing a do-it-yourself home project, remodeling, all those type of things you're going to need a dumpster. I'm the middleman between a lot of different entrepreneurs. That's uh, what I like the most. Um, he talked about diversity a lot, and I like to diversify you know, my customers. I, I have actual customers, then a lot of my customers are realtors, people that flip houses, so on and so forth. I'm, I'm writing hand-in-hand with those guys. and. Um, uh, it's, it's been doing pretty well. Um, from there, I, I, like I said, I stopped at the. I started doing business outside the state, New Orleans, and things of that nature. I don't do it a, a anymore at all. It's just more local. My um, bread and butter areas are Douglasville, Austell, Hiram, so on and so forth. Pretty much anything you need to disappear, I'm the guy. Uh, uh, they call me Magic Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll start with Ms. Tesmer. You told us a little bit about this. Um, you said you started smoking cigars with your husband as a hobby. So is that why you chose this business? And can you tell me if your business is profiting? Sure, so before um, we started this business, my husband was flipping houses in like the College Park historic um, Hateville area. And as he was looking to change careers, he's a true entrepreneur, so it's like, what can I do next? So um, that's where we kind of talked about what, what was, what was going to be the next opportunity. And we were visiting lounges frequently, having a good time, and he's like, we can do this. 
Um, he's the risk taker. I'm the more calculated one with the whole financial consulting background. Um, and so we just put our heads together, came up with a business plan, looked for an area that um, kind of needed to be filled with something like that. And so this was the perfect place for like a neighborhood, local neighborhood place for people to kind of just have somewhere to go. And we never imagined it would be as successful as it's been. Um, it's become like a destination around the country, really. I mean, in the cigar world, you can be anywhere talking about it. And like, oh, you're the ones that own the lounge in Lithia Springs. Um, so we're spreading the reputation, which is great. Um, yes, we are profitable. We, um, it's a little scary in the beginning. We opened in October 2019, and then we had to close for two months because of the pandemic. So that was a little frightening. Um, but... We have a strong uh, front of house staff and some good leadership that had stuck with us for the two years all the way through. Um, that's what's important. They talked about with teaming, like you've got to build a team that believes the way that you believe. Um, so we're profitable dollar-wise, but we're also profitable in some of our team members as well. All right, thank you. Um, Ms. President, so with the past few years we have seen um, enormous health care challenges, right? I think that's a good word, <laughs> enormous health care challenges. And I'm wondering, how has your business been affected by the pandemic? When Medicus Medical Clinic we found, was founded in, by me in 2018, and uh, the pandemic have created a lot of difficulties for a lot of businesses, including mine. Um, when we lost our lease, um, in May of last year, um, we had to go back to our business plan, and our business plan never prepared us for a pandemic. So we had to think of what we could do to reinvent the wheel and to take control over the situation. So currently, we are doing telemedicine with our clients because I was afraid that when the pandemic came and we've lost, we lost our lease, we were not able to service our our patients anymore, but the um, telemedicine has been um, a blast. I mean, we are getting so many patients because we are more, we are readily accessible and available to most of our patients, so it makes it so much easier for uh, them to get on a link and get to talk to me about their health condition and to be able to get their needs met. So it has been um, something that's different but it has been quite successful. And was that able to help sustain you? Yes, it has. And are you profitable? I am. All right, <laughs> that's good news. I'm asking because we all wanna know that, right? We all wanna know. Okay, Mr. Smith, one for you. So again, the pandemic has affected every area of our lives. Just personally, we moved uh, here about a year ago and we wanted to remodel, but guess what? We couldn't find anybody. It was too, our, what we needed to, to get done was too small. They wanted, you know, all the bigger jobs. So we still haven't remodeled. But in, so my point is, when you remodel, you have to have somebody come take the junk away, right? The debris and, and the stuff that you don't want to use. So has that affected your company? That's interesting that you asked me that. When you sent me the sample questions, I was trying to think of a negative, something negative to say so people could have a better perspective on what was going on. But honestly, um, I, I want to say, I guess I would pat myself on the back. I have a recession-proof business. Um, I actually had an incline of business during the recession when people, I was hoping for a quarantine, another one. You know, um, the do-it-yourself home projects became to uh, escalate and you can't do a um, home project without a dumpster. You can't remodel without a dumpster. You can't uh, do, you can't flip a house without a dumpster, uh, anything. Uh, so I, I actually was happy about the recession uh, the, <laughs> and the quarantine. Uh, if we had a new quarantine, my money would double actually. So I, would, I, was, I was sort of successful during the recession. And so, yes, profitable. Yes, definitely yes, profitable. profitable. So let's knock on wood. We don't have, you know, that it's not going to do that. Though. Right. Okay. Go ahead. I actually bought more equipment during the recession. Okay. So I was blessed. 
So here's a question for everybody. Um, in our uh, last question and answer with the keynote speakers, Commissioner Robinson talked a little bit about legacy. So I would like to know from each of you, ha is legacy something that you've thought about with your business and what are the things, if so, what are the things you're doing to build that legacy? Let me see, Ms. President, you're first. I believe legacy is very, very important. Um, unfortunately, even I as a medical professional, my children did not decide to go in that arena, but that does not mean that we are not able to um, allow our children to learn the business and to be able to manage it even though they are not an active participant in it. So what we've decided to do is to, right now I'm focusing more on serving and then hoping that eventually they'll come around to recognize the importance of what we do and to be able to follow suit. So yes, legacy is important. I would really um, uh, uh, ask most families to get your children involved, but if they do not want to, there is nothing much we can really do about it. We can uh, wait and see if they grow into it or because everybody wants to find their path in life and it may not be what they want to do at that time. And I'm very happy when I heard Mr. Merrill spoke about how his son has come in and taken the business over and um, it has followed a generation. That is so awesome and we're hoping that those of us, our children, are not there because they have their different paths to take in life, that they will eventually come around because we're still here, we're still working and we're still hoping that they will come in and learn the business and to be able to manage it even though they are not an active participant in actually being the front person that's doing it. Thank you. Ms. Tesma. So our legacy approach I think is a little bit different. Um, we uh, desire to be a legacy for the community more so than uh, dependents, like we have a 22-year-old daughter who's totally not interested in running a cigar business. Um, so we want to be a legacy for the community. So we've approached the business um, with a planned franchise model um, with our intent. So we plan on building three locations, um, at least three, and then selling the whole kind of enterprise um, in our retirement years so we can do whatever we decide to do when we decide to do it. So it's a little different approach, not a family legacy, but a legacy for communities. Okay, well that's legacy, mm -hmm. so, okay. Mr. Smith? I have more of a family legacy approach. I wanna leave something for, legacy is definitely important. Uh, I, I didn't have any footsteps to go behind when I was a child. Uh, I come from a single parent home from an impoverished neighborhood in uh, Macon, Georgia. I had no one to help me with, you know, starting my business. Uh, my first truck, I traded in a 2012 Impala, and I traded in for a Ram 3500. Uh, that was my first, you know, company truck. I didn't even have a personal car. I just traded my personal car for a, a real asset. So um, legacy is very important to me. I have no desire for my child to, you know, just, you know, walk, up, walk along by themselves. I want them to, you know, pretty much become a CEO just like, I was listening to my forefather over here. And I want to do the same type of thing. It's very important to me. <laughs> All right, I got two more questions for you, okay? The, the first uh, question, it has to do with expansion and teaming. So we talked a little bit about that uh, at the, with the first panel. So I was reading an article recently and um, Oscar Meyer, baloney, has teamed up with a beauty company and they're making baloney face masks, okay? Have you, did you all see this? No. So you remember how when you were little you would take the baloney and you would bite the two eyes and you would bite the mouth and you would put it on your face? So that's what they've done, but it's a, but it's a face mask. Okay, true story. Now, that team up, right, is going to allow for a whole different set of um, people buying that product, right? I don't really eat baloney, but I want to be moisturized. Maybe I'll try it, you know? Maybe, maybe I will. So my question to you all is, have you thought about unlikely partnerships 
and how it could help expand your business. Yes, ma'am. I think what has kind of organically happened is just that um, they're not necessarily unlikely, maybe. So I'm thinking of like fedora hats, like that is a staple in the cigar world. And we have been able to partner with um, individuals who are promoting their own businesses and just promote that inside the shop. I mean, there's paraphernalia that people want to wear. There's, you know, entrepreneurs who are branding themselves and doing um, podcasts and all of that. So we've got some unique relationships and, develop, and um, businesses come out of relationships just sitting in the cigar lounge, smoking together. Um, so not maybe that extreme. Um, I think there's a little nostalgia there with the whole bologna thing that I might try it too, and I'm not a big facial <laughs> person, but I do love my bologna. Um, so yeah, so does, it's created opportunity for us to promote, help others promote their businesses as well. Right. Ms. President? I believe if we didn't do partnership, but I think, we'd, I think it's um, a really great thing to network with other businesses to be able to allow them to also um, get their businesses known to others. At Medicus Medical Clinic, what we were planning for us to roll out, because of, since the pandemic, it has created um, so much uh, isolation and you know, people you know, being in their own solitary place, just like we are right now doing telemedicine. And um, we would like to be able to invite other businesses to come in and to see what we do and to allow them the opportunity to also serve the people that we serve as well. So I think working as, uh, taking a team-centered approach is always great. Um, we know we can't do everything on our own, so we need to get others that sh has a shared interest in what we do to be able to come on and, and to help us to grow in the areas that we lack. Um, we are planning on different things that, you know, incorporating other businesses to come in as we plan, you know, a self-care Friday where we can have other businesses come in to um, pitch what they do to our patients, you know, as far as, um, you know, enhancing health is concerned. So I think just creating a, a space where others can come in and to be able to enhance what we do would be a great thing, a great addition to what we do right now, um, working as in the primary care practice. All right, thank you. Mrs. Smith, you gonna bring up the rear? All right, um, partnerships actually make my business thrive. Um, at first, I, I attacked the business the wrong way. I was trying to get every single customer by myself. It was okay, but it didn't result the same as once I started talking to realtors. I started talking to um, subdivision management, to start talking to arborists, uh, carpenters, uh, so on and so forth. They make my business expand so many times, it's ridiculous, because they are already marketing and advertising to get their customers. If I'm doing the same thing, we, we meet in the middle all the time. Uh, I do work for different subdivisions in Douglasville, for example, Elk Run, Pioneer Walk. We do dumpster days in the HOA, that's what I call it, where we let the entire community, you know, use my dumpster for one fee and I just charge the HOA. Um, I partner with uh, the car wash on Fairburn Road, for example, instead of me parking my equipment at a, a lot, I park my equipment at Solar Mobile Car Wash on Far Fairburn Road. So we partner. Uh, they, they do everything under the sun but dumpster work. You know, so, you know, uh, collaboration is key. Your, your net worth is your network. Yep. <laughs> All right. So I, my, the last question. So I know you m might be sitting there thinking, I thought she said this was a diversity uh, Panel. Yeah, I did say that. So, the, but the last question is going to kind of tie all that together. So, um, just think back to the things that we've already talked about. We talked about how the pandemic has affected business. We talked about, you know, a little bit why you started your business. Um, just talked about teaming um, with unlikely partners. We talked about uh, legacy. So, um, I want to give you all an opportunity, Mr. Smith, you're going to be first, so, you know, get, get ready. <laughs> We're going to go Mr. Smith, Ms. President, Ms. Tesmer. 
Um, I want you to talk a little bit about how your, um, the way you identify, Mrs. Smith is identifying as a veteran, Ms. President is identifying as a woman, Ms. Tesmer is identifying as an African American business owner. Um, how the way you identify has affected your business in any or all of those areas and any challenges or maybe was it easier? All right, should I give you a moment to think about it or you got it? Go ahead, okay. Being a black business owner can be challenging, but um, being a, a black veteran business owner, to be honest, it's nothing but positives. Uh, I consider it being easier. It's easier to obtain each customer. Uh, being a veteran comes with different types of attributes that the customer is looking for, punctuality, uh, they're gonna finish the mission, they're gonna finish the job. I don't counsel. Um, I don't care if it's raining, snowing, I don't care about any of that, I'm gonna make it happen. Um, they usually have something to, uh, they, we already have a built relationship because either they have done some type of military service, their mother, their father, their sister, their brother, you know, uh, they're pretty much grateful of my service uh, overseas or in their garage, you know, uh, so. They see my trucks around town. I, you'll see my truck. I, I, all of my trucks are camouflaged. You see me at the quick trip. I'm usually there 30, 45 minutes talking to Vietnam vets, Desert Storm vets, so on and so forth. So I have a uh, great positive outlook from being a veteran owned business owner. I, I, I love it. All right, good. Ms. Tesla? Oh, did I, oh, did I say that? Okay. As a woman in business, um, what are some of the challenges that we face? I think it's because we, we, we are multitasking. We have our families, we have business, we are wife, we are mom. And um, one of the things that I've found um, uh, with being a, a woman business owner is how we can actually um, switch from one role to the next. We have the audacity for us to go out there and do it, to leave our homes, put on our boss hat, put on our high heel slippers, get to work, get the job done, get back home, take off our boss hat, put on our, uh, <laughs> our, um, <laughs> our house slippers, and to be submissive for those of us that are married to our husbands and to our family. And I'm thinking, wow. How do we do that? And we do it time and time again while we go back and to be successful in, in the workplace. So I'm thinking as a woman, we, we can do so many things and we're so, we have so many layers within our own scope to be able to do so much and still be successful at what we do. I like it that as we, because we are nurturers, we are able to get out there and to be able to care for the people who really needs us the most. Um, we know how to reach and touch the hearts of others because we know how it feels for us to be in a place where we need to um, connect with people on that level. So I'm really grateful as a woman that we can actually get out there, get the job done, and to know that people appreciate what we do um, in business every day. Thank you, Ms. Tesmer. I mean, I don't know what else to say after that, really. Um, I echo all of that. Um, we do wear a lot of hats. Um, we're required to be very versatile. There are challenges that transcend what any type of business that you venture into, whether you are working for somebody or working for yourself. Um, and so the key there is to just never give up. You're going to encounter obstacles, um, but push through, um, and you can, you know, overcome. Um, I think for the business that we're in, it's, it's a very relational business. Someone comes and smokes a cigar, they're with us for at least an hour, at least an hour. And there's a lot of just sitting and talking, getting to know people. And so being able to figure out where you can connect with people um, helps the business succeed overall. Um, so I, don't, I won't say that there are no challenges, but it's been easy because you put forth the effort to just get to know the people that you can partner and network to build your net worth. I like that. <laughs> okay, so thank you. Let's give them a round, guys. I think we have time for two or three questions. Does the audience have something? Anybody outgoing? Okay, all right, yes, ma'am. I'm not 
sure. I'm not sure that. Can I ask Mr. Merrill? Yes. Okay. And ask anybody a question, not just. Yeah. Uh oh. Okay, Mr. Merrill. Um, my question we talk about legacy, and you, you, as a developer, and I know you've done urban development and that sort of thing. A lot of times, um, you were talking about East Point, developing in East Point years ago. A lot of times when um, an, an area that may be uh, historically uh, uh, an African-American community previously gets developed, you know, what, what do they call it, uh, gentrification, um, there's no history left from the people that maybe settled that area. I, I'm originally from Durham, North Carolina, um, and since you went to school in Durham, you may know this area. Um, there's an area in Durham called um, Wall, Walltown, and it was settled by black, fam by black people um, who wanted to, who, who worked for Duke University. And so um, it's now becoming gen gen gentrified. There, and the people are struck, what, what the people, there's still families that, original families that still live there. Um, you know, their, their, their descendants. And I think this is probably true in most major cities. Um, nothing, I mean, there's the, the history is not recorded in any way once it gets gentrified, it just goes away. So um, uh, in some areas, like in Tampa, Florida now, they're doing uh, um, legacy walls and, uh, um, uh, you know, keeping the history built into the development and the re gentrification And I think, um, I just wondered, has, um, as a developer, has that come to the table for you as partnering with people who um, want to keep that history or, uh, uh, and, and record that history and, and put that up, you know, put that, and uh, weave that into that development? Well, that is a great, that is a great question. Uh, when gentrification first came along, uh, probably 30, 40 years ago, everybody thought it was a good thing. They thought they were making houses that otherwise wouldn't be repaired, repairing them, uh, and then other groups moved in. Uh, gentrification then became an economic issue. Uh, in fact, what was happening is that young people largely uh, or older developers could come in and buy houses cheaply and then renovate those houses and then resell them and that was a good business it really wasn't until the last 20 years that people begin to uh, to understand fully what you're talking about i think and that is the downside of gentrification and it's substantial and i think that now, and I, I read a lot, uh, and I, I, I wasn't in Durham, I was in Chapel Hill, but of course Duke is close to the University of North Carolina and then on the other side of North Carolina State. Uh, and what has happened is not good. Uh, it's a loss of history, uh, and it needs to be addressed. And I think uh, uh, it needs to be addressed probably more than just the walls. And that is a certain, and I think Atlanta's taken some action in this, and certain areas need to be set aside. Uh, they need to be helped uh, so that they, in fact, can uh, improve the houses themselves. And I think that's going to happen more and more as cities realize exactly what you said. What you, what you just said, people don't talk about a lot. Uh, gentrification, they talk about the upside, and that is the quote, cleaning up of the neighborhood, but it is a loss of history. More importantly, on a human scale, it's a loss of homes. We're seeing it on the west side here in Atlanta, uh, but they are proactively trying to address it, and I hope they do it successfully. The good news is I think the trend is toward that rather than simply cleaning out an area or buying an area cheaply and then having young people move in and then the older people, the people who have the history move out and whose forebears had the history. So it's a great question. Uh, is it being addressed adequately yet? No, but is the trend beginning to move significantly in that way? I think so, and I certainly hope so. Great question though, very thoughtful. Thank you, Mr. Merrill. So I was just told I was going too slow 
So we're going to have to move forward. We can take some more questions at the end. David, this means you're up. I'm going to introduce Mr. David Good. He is an award-nominated editor. Let me get back on my mark. He's an award-nominated editor, publishing consultant, writing coach, journalist, political consultant and strategist, community leader, advocate, communicator, and government liaison. He is the founder of Reading Consulting Firm and a focus-based consulting firm. During his over 20 years of experience, he has served as a columnist, journalist, president of a media group, publishing consultant, public relations director, book editor, presentation designer, and more. Among other opportunities, David currently serves as the communication director for the 2016 SPLOST program in his community. Here, he communicates about the program and its opportunities through media, press releases, elected officials, citizens, corporations, business owners, contractors, government organizations, and other stakeholders. Through his leadership experience and networking, Mr. Good has developed strong relationships with politicians on both sides of the aisle, civic, church, legal, and community leaders. Routinely called upon for his political and community knowledge base and communication style. Let's welcome Mr. David Good. Thank you, David. Okay, what about, uh, what about now? How about now? Yep. Okay, awesome. I'm going to speak <laughs> pretty loudly. Um, I've been part of this, uh, doing business with Douglas County since its inception in 2018. Uh, so I want to thank first um, Madam Chair who actually put a call to action when she took office and she said Douglas County is open for business. We took that as a sign of getting things ready, making sure that everyone, no matter what they do, no matter wh why they do it, that they actually have op opportunity here in Douglas County. Um, Vice Chair started this um, doing business over there in 2018. And the first time was actually with uh, District 1 Commissioner Henry Mitchell, who actually really was an advocate for young small business people at that time. When Madam Carthen came in, and um, I believe it was in the 2018 election when she came in, one of the first things she did after Madam Chair started the uh, Purchasing Oversight Committee and pushing that is that she really made it easier for DBEs, minority-owned businesses, to actually get a foot into the door. She opened it up and gave the opportunity. People started going in there and doing the, doing the work. And as um, Madam, um, as Madam Carthy has always said, just get in the door and start doing the, doing the work. Just get it going. And then with um, District 4 Commissioner Ann jones Guider, she has always been about local participation. If you're locally, you should actually be able to get work done here in Douglas County, and that's what this is about. So if you look at this um, at the next page, this is something actually I came up with uh, last night so you guys can actually have something to see. We have 143 vendors with the current SPLOS right now. And with those 143 vendors, we do 90 projects. So what does that tell you? If there's 90 projects and there's 143 vendors, that means that there's some teaming going on. There's some networking going on. There's some relationships going on. And right now, we actually have uh, 33 active projects, and the other 57 have been finished. So we're in our fifth year of SPLOS, and the fifth year ends um, this coming uh, March, and then we have one more year um, that ends in April 2023. Then we'll be done with the SPLOS. And so um, let's go to the next slide. Here locally, we actually have 54 vendors right here in Douglas County. The rest of the vendors are right around the 30, around 30 uh, miles outside of Douglas County. So right now we are representing 68% of the actual SPLOS when it comes to vendors. And we do all this just through networking, um, collaboration, making sure that large firms understand what's going on and are able to actually get a relationship with smaller firms. Uh, next slide, please. One of the things that we've always talked about, especially uh, talking to Commissioner Robinson, Vice Chair, he always wanted to know, well, I understand that we have a lot of people who are doing the work, but are they getting, are they getting the revenue for it? What are we expending? So right now, if you look locally, it's expending um, $37.6 million um, to people that's considered local firms, and that's up to 57%. Um, next slide, please. Now, when it comes to the DBEs, one thing I always want people to understand is that if there is a county or a city, especially um, Atlanta, if you go in there and they have DBEs, 
It does not matter if you're a minority phone firm, a woman-owned firm, a veteran-owned firm. If you do not have DBE, they do not count that as being part of their relationship. You have to become a DBE in order to get that relationship. You have to get that certification. And so with this plus, we end up doing both the DBEs and we do uh, minority-owned firms, women-owned firms, veteran-owned firms, and what have you. And with that, we're seeing that we're at 80%. So of those 33 projects, 80% have minority DBE or veteran on uh, participation. And when I first started doing this as a call to action uh, back in 20, in the 2018, we were around five or 6%. So we've gone from five or 60% all the way up to 80% just because we let people know what was going on. Um, next slide, please. Now these are our projects. See are some of the projects for each one of our categories. Uh, we have the first category is fire EMS. That represents 32%. Uh, we have um, transportation, which represents uh, 50, um, what is that, 51%. And then the last 17% is in parks and rec. These six projects that you see up here, all of them have some form of teaming. The first one is it was our radio system. Uh, that one is was our largest uh, project to date until now that we're getting ready to do the road widening. With that project, there was two firms in the whole country that knew how to put radio system together. One of them was Motorola who won it. They actually have about 32 companies that they teamed with just to get that project done. From everything, just putting the cables um, together, running the radio system, something had to be done and they saw that teaming was and we had a number of local firms local minority firms, they work with Motorola to get that done. If you go into the transportation, you will see the um, covert over at Whitestone over in District 4. There's a minority firm right here in Douglas County, the Corvair Group. They're the ones that actually um, are, you know, finished that project. And I believe now they're also doing a project on uh, Maxim Road. And then the last one, we actually have Parks and Rec. Uh, we, those are two of our larger grand openings we've had this year. Um, one of them is the uh, 7,000, um, I guess really about seven, a little bit over $7 million was spent on putting together that 30,000 square foot um, place and it just opened up recently this year. And uh, well actually late, late last year. And then the same thing we have with the um, senior center. The senior center over there in, um, in District 1 in Lithia Springs, it is open to the public. Uh, we had a grand opening there and it was a very beautiful uh, situation. Uh, next slide, please. Now, this is something that most people do not know of. Um, this is what we call the MMIP. It's the, multi, it's the Multimobile um, Improvement uh, Plan by GDOT. And what they're doing is that they're building the flyover over uh, I-20 going over 285. And it'll start in Douglas County. It goes through Cobb and through Fulton and then goes over to 285. So instead of slowing down behind those 18 wheelers to go under, um, under the free, under 20, now you'll fly over I-20. And then if you're coming back, they're building about five more lanes just to take you off into full industrial, then, uh, mm -hmm. then, you know, set up everything. And then there's going to be a new street, a new uh, lane that's going to go all the way into Thornton, uh, Thornton Road. So that lane will go from, I believe, 18 homes all the way until you get to, uh, to it joins up with their lane at Thornton Road. Same thing on the other side going the other way. Uh, next slide, please. And this is actually a brochure that's on their website that tells you exactly how you could become a DBE. If anyone tries to charge you for it, walk away because it's free. So make sure that you go to their website, you go to the GDOT, look up um, DBE, you can look up MMIP, because what they're doing with the MMIP is that they are 100% looking for local companies. They're looking for minority-owned companies. There's, that's why they have a specific company, CEI, that actually is uh, doing some work with GDOT just to make sure that you guys are able to go out there. And when you become a DBE, the first thing they do is they help you get federal contracts. And being a DBE is not, some people take it as a bad word sometimes, but what it is is that at one point in time, those that are DBEs, they were not welcome into places like here. You know, there was not a relationship that people were willing to do with companies that decided to become a DBE. So please, if you do not have your DBE, if, you do, if you're not certified anything, get your certifications and get that work done. Uh, next slide. And this is my information, uh, David Good. And the picture that was there was actually at uh, Commissioner uh, Carthen's first town hall, one of the largest um, town halls that we've had outside of the courthouse. And again, uh, thank you. I'll take any questions if, if Wendy um, directs me.
No, you can't have any questions yet. We'll <laughs> okay. do them at the end. Don't yes, worry. But thank you, David. Thank you. All right, you guys are in for a treat. You get the first look, an exclusive. You guys have an exclusive of an exciting new program Commissioner Robinson is bringing to the county, and he's going to tell you about it. Okay, roll it. Everybody wants to be able to pursue happiness, but you need a foundation. As we come through the pandemic, what it revealed to us is that there was a need. We need to get back to the fundamentals. This course, this class, this series is designed to address that need. From lost revenue to job loss and even loss of life, the pandemic has revealed one thing. Many people are in need of a financial plan, a plan that is pandemic proof, a plan that can start with the Douglas County Masterclass Series, free online learning, offering financial and entrepreneurship recovery fundamentals. Everything is about finances, follow the money. And so from that perspective, we've got some concepts that we believe that are gonna be fundamental for people being stabilized financially. The five-part Masterclass Series offers the basics in financial literacy to get everyone started on their road to financial freedom. Once we got our finances stable, then there's opportunity for entrepreneurship. From laying the proper financial foundation to learning about purposeful spending and budgeting, these tools will provide quick lessons whether you or your family are trying to own a home, planning for college, planning to invest, planning for retirement, long-term care, or just a vacation. I'm a new mother. Every dollar counts right now and for her future. Masterclass has her covered. I'm a 21-year-old college student. I'm interested in investing and watching my money grow. Masterclass has him covered. I'm working countless hours a week to provide for my family. When will it make sense to retire? From budgeting to saving and investing to creating the right money mindset, Douglas County's Masterclass Series has you covered. Federal funding was used to fund this. That is our source of funding, and so we're directing it directly to the citizens um, for their direct benefits. So you have a more stabilized citizen, more financially sound, more economically sound, then the whole county can prosper out of that existence. The online series gives access to tips from experts available 24 hours a day. The best way to secure your future is to have your financial house in order. With Masterclass weekly updates and social engagement. Now that looks like something I can get into. Now it's time to teach people how to fish. So we believe that they'll be a more enriched citizen at the end of the day. The bottom line is that we'll be a better Douglas at the end of the day. The Douglas County Masterclass Series, the financial and entrepreneurship recovery fundamentals. All right, so as we, we're bringing this full circle, and this is what this is really about. Um, you know, I've been, um, since 9 11, I, I see my colleague back there, I'm gonna bring him up in a minute. Since um, it was 9 11 2001, 21 years ago, uh, where I, um, in my own personal life, what it meant to be, uh, what it meant to be an entrepreneur, to teach. Um, you know, uh, there's something about fundamentals that I've seen over 21 years. I've seen it in academia, the fourth largest urban university in the nation. I've been around a lot of masters, two of them that we just saw today. And I've watched your lives. So when I interact with you, um, thank you to our panelists earlier and stuff, and uh, Ms. Tesmer and stuff, because uh, she's a witness that I'm always listening. It's all about paying attention, right? It's not always about our First Amendment. Right? We all benefit from each other. We all sharpen each other. Iron sharpens iron. And so, you know, my, part of my, my lead back is that, okay, the fundamental thing I get, I, excuse me, out of all the citizens I see, is that simply uh, we don't understand the fundamentals. We don't understand how things work. We can't see. I mean, we talk about vision. We talk about plan. We talk about action. This entrepreneurship series I'm bringing out, this financial series, it's just that. It's to teach you the fundamentals. In other words, I want you to know these 10 things regarding financial, right? How to grow your money, manage your money, diversify your money, transfer your money, right? There's some fundamentals that are universal that you gotta get. 
how to build a business, you know, vision, plan, action, harvest. I mean, it, it's one of those like, do you have you know, anything yet? When this comes out, yes, we had a grant program. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Carthen. Yes, we gave out a grant program, you know, $2,500 to the micro uh, business, but that's a one time. They ate it one time and it's gone. The feds gave y'all this money, now I'm in the room. <laughs> they gave you that money. I mean, somebody called me and like, okay, so what happened? You, you got you know, $300,000 and you didn't spend not even 60% on wages? Like, really? See, I'm sure that's why I'm what I am. Like, okay, y'all, y'all playing. Don't do that. It's a certain discipline, right? I mean, do, do right. Don't do the edges. It will catch up with you. So some of this is what I'm bringing to the table is that, okay, look, this is all you need to know. These 10 concepts regarding finance, these things regarding entrepreneurship, and we're gonna do it like we just had. You know, Harrison, thank you so much for being here. Michael was here earlier. We're gonna bring people like that that's gonna be teaching these. Heads of state regarding finance. Heads of state regarding entrepreneurship. Our own citizens are gonna be involved in these various series and stuff. So over the next nine months, we're gonna be rolling this out as part of the art money. Again, one more time, we, uh, we did grant money where we gave everybody a fish. Thank you, board. They gave me half to give, the others to teach. Right? In other words, that one time, and that's it. I need to leave something that y'all left something that y'all can apply and duplicate and do better. Right? This is what this is about. Right? In other words, my, my, my fundamental issue before I leave office is for y'all to make sure y'all understand how this works. How to, how to make your government work for you. How to extract. How, thank you, David. How to tap into this. It's hidden from you. And I'm blind. I'm like, okay, y'all don't see this? Like, no, this is how you need to do this. I'm going to tell you freely, but you got to do your part. You've got to listen, you've got to engage. So I'm, I'm excited about what we've got. I, I can't belabor the night. I've got to close this out, guys. I know we started a little bit late and stuff. Think, guys, can we give Wendy Cottle a hand clap for her efforts tonight? Please give Wendy, Wendy, thank you, thank you. I couldn't have done this. This is all Wendy. Uh, Fred, Tiffany, to the whole team, everybody, Sierra, all of you guys that were involved in pulling this. I know y'all have to deal with me, but you know, it's about, it's about the citizens, right? Y'all now see what this was all about. Um, it's not about us. And so um, I, I promise to you guys I will make the, the government more sensitive to the citizens, things I have to go through to, to make this available for you, to get you the information that you need, right? We're, you're not here to serve us. We're here to serve you. It's attitude, it's mindset. And so we're on our way. We're in the best financial condition we've ever been in a decade. Let's give Madam Chair a hand clap on this one, y'all. Yeah. Oh, it's, oh, it's solid. Six months cash, no, we, we got this. But the question is, yes, Congress has built all of us out. Jurisdictions, everybody, we got something to work with now. Now, let's move forward. We all gotta recalibrate. We all gotta refocus. We all gotta, okay, we, it ain't going back that way no more. All right, let, let's, let's go now. They gave you something to work with. They really have. They created this atmosphere like, look, everything is changing. Jobs, like, create your job. If you don't want that job, create your own. But there's some fundamentals about sustainability. You can't just drop that on, on, on Facebook and say, like, look, I'm live. That's not sustainable. Yeah, you'll get your cash, your cheese, young ones, your millennials. I hear you. But I'm mentoring them as well. Say, OK, guys, but how do you extend this thing? Are you paying to the, uh, to the politics how they're shifting? your own landscape, your own environment, right? So anyway, we've got a great event in, um, that's in store again over time. This is my fifth annual. I'm not gonna go any further than this, but I do just wanna talk to one of the citizens. Dr. Robert Watkins, can you come up here real quick for me? This is a guy, let's welcome him, guys. He was there from the beginning, one of our citizens out of District 3. Dr. Thank you. Watkins, I want you to just come up here and yeah. what did you see, what did you hear, and how did this resonate uh, with the citizens? We're gonna close this out. Absolutely. Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Robert Watkins and um, uh, CEO of Conquer Worldwide, a, a consultant company that's been here in Douglas County for the last 25 years. I've owned land here for the last 35 years. And uh, Commissioner Robinson and I used to teach um, uh, entrepreneurship at Emory University. And he was talking about vision, plan, action back then. And the students would come and be a part of our our, um, our Kings and Priests University there at uh, Emory University, and they would leave broke, and they would come back and ask us for money. And Kelly said, well, didn't, didn't you learn anything in our class? And so the things that he's teaching now, he was teaching 25 years ago. This has been in his heart. 
and he has absolutely been faithful. And boy, I'm telling you, we have come a long way. And I'm proud of all of our commissioners. I'm proud to be uh, a Douglasville entrepreneur. I just got off of a plane. I also live in Orlando as well. But we came here, and I just want to say, man, you're doing a great job. And uh, this master class, I just have one correction. You're not teaching us how to fish. Let's throw that out. You're teaching us how to own the whole pond. So now we can create taxes. We can create jobs. We can economic development 30 years ago. And I was here in this county that was not a term in this county. And the room didn't look like this. So I would say thank you, Commissioner Robinson, for all that you're doing. And Madam Chair, my commissioner as well, and uh, all of the leaders here. Brother Mike, I think he's here somewhere, Mike Russell. And uh, thank you guys for having us. And uh, man, keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. All right, with that being said, guys, ladies and gentlemen, right now, I need, where's my chair? Madam Chair? Where, is, is my chair out there? I'm here. Madam Chair? Come on up. Madam Chair, always, in anything I do, no matter what, she always gets the last word. Madam Chair, come on up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner Robinson and our Vice Chairman of the Board of Commissioners. First and foremost, let's just give him a hand. He's an amazing <laughs> commissioner. We thank you, Commissioner Robinson, for allowing us to see one, do one, and teach one. Um, you and I and the Board of Commissioners have been committed to building back better. At the beginning of the year, and I know Commissioner Carthen will state, and she, she uh, re uh, iterated my words, and I said, she, someone's listening. Thank you so much, Commissioner Carthen. We, this year, we are revitalizing, revamping, and re we are rebuilding. So thank you so much, Commissioner Robinson, for doing business around Douglas. This is your fifth annual event, and I know we will continue this effort. Uh, this is a proud moment for me to just see how far Douglas County have come. Uh, you know, I was, I was in a meeting today, and I heard some words that really resonated with me, and it says, vision without action is halluc hallucination. I said, that makes sense, because you just, really, you just, really just blowing smoke. But I've seen some great things happen in Douglas County in the last six years that I've been in my office, and it's absolutely unbelievable. Our body of work is massive, and I cannot leave the stage without thanking Vice Chairman Kelly Robinson, who I could call just at a moment's notice. And I'm always dreaming, and he always take the helm and make my dreams come true. So thank you so much, Commissioner Robinson. Thank you. Thank you. And I appreciate you allowing me just to say a few words. Thank you. All right. Wendy closes out. Wendy. Well, I'm afraid to say too much. Um, but we want to respect your time. Uh, we know that we've gone over. Thank you so much for hanging in there with us to the end. Um, if our panelists and our panelists and commissioners would just stay so we can get some pictures. And don't forget about your assignment. Have you gotten your two people? We're going to give you a chance. If you didn't, get up, mingle, get your two people, okay? Thank you for coming. I believe your, the video will be available on our Facebook. Is that right, Tech? Okay, so if you have friends that couldn't be here tonight, direct them to our Celebrate Douglas Facebook page. They can watch the, the program, okay? Thank you all for coming. Have a good night. Good night, everyone.